Good morning. <sighs> so how about those live streams, huh? <laughs> I get, well, well, actually, I don't think they were live streams. Oh, I think one of them was a live stream. I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> Either way, um, oh no, Mike Mike. I forgot about Mike Mike. Poor Mike Mike is trapped at home. I need to make extra Mike Mikes. Mike Mokes. I need to order more circuit boards. Although, Mike Mike is an extremely simple circuit. got a pro micro you've got a mic mic pro micro mic mic get it you getting naming convention here <clears throat> I'm thirsty and I must drink coffee so that's what the coffee is for quenching your thirst yes it does not make you more thirsty that's a lie it's made up by the anti-coffee lobby Coffee has vitamins and minerals that those fat cats in Washington don't want you to know about. Sorry, don't want you to know about. This coffee sponsorship is sponsored by coffee. The coffee's pretty good. <clears throat> I have been experimenting with breakfast. Uh, in that, I'm having it. <laughs> and then I'm seeing how, seeing how my day goes after that. trying to get, I'm trying to eat more eggs, I'm trying to increase my egg intake. Just because it fills me up, not because I'm, I'm bodybuilding. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Hunting season's coming up. Had, uh, desires, I guess, to uh, to do not live stream, but record an entire hunt. And my uh, my GoPro is my Go GoPro uh, behaves very strangely. Uh, it, is, it seems to be broken in some way, and I'm actually not sure how. <clears throat> Because it's like the software locks up on it. It's old, but you know. Still, uh, I do have a. Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about parts. Like what's what's available, what's usable, what's reusable. You know how to keep things long term and have uh, have tools to work with. Because for someone like me, if you don't have silicone, you don't really have much. <clears throat> so getting uh, appropriate silicone, taking care of it, getting appropriate tools and taking care of them, got an uh, oscilloscope finally on the way. I wasn't quite sure how to handle an oscilloscope, especially the, the cost, but I think I found a good medium. I got a uh, USB, a pretty standard, fair. USB oscilloscope with a logic analyzer. <coughs> it's a six channel logic analyzer, which is a little weird, but I don't know why it would be six, but whatever. It's still, you know, just fine. And that is kind of weird, actually, but it's better than <laughs> no logic analyzers. <laughs> like, scopes are like the entire tube and everything like that. Uh, so, finding out about a USB <clears throat> scope, I was like, oh cool, well, then I can have a, a screen and battery power elsewhere, you know, the, the 
the screen is in another device, is in the computer, and the, the battery powering it is in the computer, so you've got a power source for it. But uh, I was concerned about the software, <clears throat> and I found out that they have a, that there's an open source version of the software for the, for that tool, for that oscilloscope. Which I was like, <laughs> I don't know, it's getting, it's becoming more, uh, more standard. Linux, it's taking, it's going places. It might be a little too late for it, but whatever. We'll find out. Maybe OpenBSD will <laughs> bounce back. It'll be open. Those OpenBSD weirdos were right all along, of course. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So, we looked at uh, Amazon for reviews because that's all Amazon should be used for, is an aggregator for reviews. Although, if the product is popular enough, you start to wonder about even that. Um, <clears throat> but the reviews were of people that were having experience with the scope and I was like oh I should search for Linux in the reviews I'm like there's no way people are on here like hey there's probably like two reviews that talk about Linux and the top review talked about the software compatibility with open I forget the name of it but basically Linux software for it <laughs> open source Linux software for it I was like oh Wow, and the next few reviews that were also in the top also mentioned it. So, <laughs> uh, that is a, an important side note. Uh, it's, it's about software um, life cycles or software lifetimes, I guess you could say, um, because the the company that made the product has moved on, which is is normal. Uh, the company moved on to producing other things and didn't want to dedicate any resources to updating the software. So there's a lot of old scopes out there, uh, USB scopes, that the software is incompatible with current versions of Windows or the software is bad. Just like uh, obtuse, you know, pick, pick any number of bad software design features and just uh, put them in a bag and then pull some random ones out. Um, <clears throat> so the, <laughs> this is like, a particular instance where the software is bad and the, the company doesn't want to support it with the intention of getting people to buy new software. Yeah, upgrade essentially. And then people were like, no, it's not okay. We're going to make our own software with Blackjack. Uh, and they made a, an open, open source version of the software. And now that, uh, you know, that product can continue to sell. It's like, oh, Gee, Mr. Corporation, the, so the, the old product that you've already designed that you want to get rid of the old stock of, that you've already made new versions for and you're trying to sell, but pe it isn't selling as well as the old version? Well, making good software made your sales go up? What? And not to mention that, it's, it's open source, it's just like some dude working on it. For free. This is that whole bit about uh, software, uh, open, open software. <clears throat> I still think it evolves a little bit too slowly, but at this point, uh, I think we've evolved a little bit too quickly <laughs> as far as software uh, design philosophy and features. Uh, I think that's the problem, actually. So, uh, I was recently introduced, which is kind of surprising, to uh, Richard Stallman's manifesto, and I, I mean, I had I, I had read excerpts in the past. But I did not know that his entire thing was uh, what it was all about. But I did find it particularly interesting to read... Uh, oh. Uh, I have mentioned my hot take before about uh, universal basic income. And uh, it is... I think it was Ray Kurzweil who said that by the year 2000, uh, we're going to have so much technology automating things and making things easier and work and jobs easier that we're not going to work 40 hour work weeks, we're going to work 15 hour work weeks. Pretty impressive, huh? Right? Right? All this automation? <clears throat> well, I was recently introduced to a book called uh, BS Jobs, except the BS is spelled out and there's no asterisk in there. It's, it's the full word. B-U-L-L-S-H-I-T Jobs. And uh, he posits that we did hit the 15-hour work week and that everyone pretty much just spends the rest, the remaining 25 hours wandering around doing things that don't really matter. 
and killing time and updating Facebook statuses, <clears throat> which I think jibes. So my, my point about the, my hot take about the UBI was that um, we already have UBI because people are, <clears throat> because the amount of people who do not create product, the, the amount of people who do not perform services is increasing while the, uh, and everything else is pretty much staying the same. Like people doing reports, people doing uh, compliance checks, people doing things that do not generate output, product, anything like that. <clears throat> Paper pushers, office workers, that kind of thing. Uh, of which I am, uh, to an extent, uh, some, some part of that. <clears throat> but I'm the one that automates myself out of jobs constantly, so yeah, maybe I'm the poster child for automation. Um, <clears throat> But that's, you know, that was my take, is we already have UBI. We just have a bunch of nonsense jobs that people show up for and do very small amounts of work, you know, actual direct work. <clears throat> and then there's just a lot of time wasting and meetings and, uh, you know, uh, strategic uh, planning sessions and things like that. And those are all things that come with usually large corporations or corporations uh, that have, or, or small firms with too much money. <laughs> And his point in that book, it's called, it's by, it's by David Graeber, G-R-A-E-B-E-R, -E -E um, but very interesting, very funny, very, very humorously written. Um, I haven't finished it yet, so it might take a horrible turn near the end, but so far, so far, very, very on the nose. Um, and I think it's a very solid indicator of what's, uh, what's wrong with a lot of these industries. Uh, but I was surprised to learn that uh, <clears throat> while my takes, my takes on the software industry and the overproduction and the waste in the software industry uh, seem to apply to other <laughs> industries. So perhaps it's just a uh, an American thing or a Western thing or a debt-based economy thing where we just have to keep keep churning, keep churning, just keep churning. Um, oh. That guy was gonna cut across. <clears throat> Where was I? Let me scummy people turn. Yeah. Uh, his his particular take on it though was that the people are, uh, the particular BS jobs are the jobs where the individual performing the job can't even convince themselves that they're doing something worthwhile. Like they themselves, the people performing the task, are the ones most convinced of the uselessness of the job. <laughs> <clears throat> so that might, that might limit it somewhat, but still, you know, 20% useless jobs is still a whole lot of jobs. Did I, did I forget to mention that the largest employer in the United States is the federal government? Yeah, not a, not a waste there. Anyways, <clears throat> uh, Richard Stallman was talking about, in the manifesto, he was talking about how, uh, you know, shouldn't programmers be paid for their work? And he said, yes. However, if people program enough, people will program for free, first of all, which we've seen that definitely to be the case. Uh, and secondly, when people program for free, when we start automating these things, we will approach a post-scarcity world. And I don't know if, like, theologically, I believe in a post-scarcity world, but it would be pretty nice to have, I think. Uh, I did have my eyes open pretty recently about the potential for, you know, in the post-scarcity world, we're supposed to all exist as, like, uh, as artists who just, like, paint paintings, and then people are like, wow, I'll pay you $10,000 for that painting. Here you go. And you're like, thank you. And then you live off that $10,000 for like a month or something. I don't know how it's exactly supposed to work out. But the idea is that we do art and uh, music and stuff like that. And then that's enough, you know, creative work. Um, but there's a, you know, I, I had agreed with that. I was like, that's probably how it would work out. And uh, I realized that it's absolutely, positively not the case. <laughs> Not even close. Like, less than 10% of the population probably is actually creative, and less than that is actually driven to create. 
Um, I think those numbers bear out pretty clearly when you start looking at the, the creative pursuits and creative uh, the percentage of people who are actually creative and creating. I don't think the brakes are suddenly going to come off of that train, you know, the, the creativity train as soon as people can stay home. Um, I don't think that's how it's going to work out. So, uh, but his, his whole point about the post-scarcity thing is if, if computer programmers do the work and they do the work well, then we will automate to the point where we only have to work 15 hours, you know, where we're, we don't have to do, you know, the, the work will be primarily spent of working a few hours a day to maintain the, the systems that are doing whatever the systems are doing to create money or create wealth or whatever. But it, the whole point was about, you know, reducing the amount of hours that people work per week. And that's, uh, I find that very interesting that it, that jibes with all these, these other concepts or, they're coalescing in my head. Um, <clears throat> this, <laughs> this is a this is a slide case for the Digi Rule. It's a little tight right now, but uh, you know. <laughs> oh man, I'm a gigantic nerd. 